Now we've been talking a lot uh, about this scan and that scan and the other new scan and the old scans. Uh, and it's important to know uh, how much radiation we're getting from all of those. We have one of the uh, experts in the whole United States on uh, radiation health safety. Greg Espinan is here at uh, the hospitals in Louisiana, and he is going to teach us all that. Greg? Can you mic me up or? No. We're just right, right here. here, we're good. Hi there. I need to wake you all up, okay? Everybody stand up. We'll get real excited. Let's move around. It's South Louisiana. I want to tell you about radioactivity. You all know what radioactivity is? Down in South Louisiana on a Saturday night when we put the radio on down on the bayou and everybody get up and dance to that radio, that's that radioactivity. Let's have a little radioactivity here. Now, my mama didn't raise a dummy. I've been sitting back there, yeah, Gene, I've been sitting back there and I noticed all this candy on the table. I also noticed these blindfolds. So these pinatas up here are ready for y'all. Let's come on up and whack at these guys, okay? <laughs> y'all can have a seat. It's a pleasure to be here. I don't know how to operate this thing. I'm, I, all these years in school, just that way up and we're good. All right, let's go up and see if I can actually figure out who I am. Hi there, I'm Greg Espinan. I take a very different approach to medical physics. Why? Because I'm not a doctor. I'm not smart enough to be a doctor, I'm just a nuclear physicist. <laughs> At least that's what the doctors tell me. You know, I get paid an awful lot of money for the things that scare the hell out of people and I'd like to keep it that way, so we're gonna stay ignorant today, I'm not gonna give you a talk. No, actually, we're going to go through this, and it's going to be really simple. Don't be impressed by all the letters behind my name. The ones I love the most are D-A-D, -D, Dad. Okay. What I'd like to begin this talk with is that for many years, I was actually directly involved in high-dose therapy, and I got to interact with you patients. And uh, if damn Phil Boudreaux just sold my thunder. The thing I miss the most is patient care with y'all. I've become the Wizard of Oz. I'm like the guy who's behind the, the uh, scenes now. I do some stuff in the lab. I do a little bit of research here and there. But I don't get to interact with you people. And I'd like to begin with the fact that I enjoy interacting with y'all on a daily basis. And I do miss that. Because um, I've, I've become a little bit more of the geek. Like I said, the guy who hangs out in the laboratory and tries to figure stuff out. For those that don't know me, um, I have been doing high-dose therapies um, sometimes since the 1990s, early. Um, I was involved with a lot of the lutetium stuff that was done in Houston uh, behind the scenes. I actually calculated all the kidney doses to make sure that those doses stayed safe. So I've worked with the lutetium, I've developed some of my own pharmaceuticals, but basically what I'm here to talk about is the stuff that nobody ever explains to you that radioactivity. You remember we got up and danced to it? Well, we're going to see what we can do to explain this stuff to y'all. Okay? Um, as a patient group, you've been exposed to lots of different scans. You've had Octrea scans, you've had CT scans over the year, and basically they'll say, well, it doesn't matter, the dose that you got was insignificant, it doesn't matter how much you get over time. And, you know, after a while, it begins to add up a little bit, and you'd really like to know what you got, okay? Um, some of these imaging modalities we don't really need to talk about because they don't produce ionizing radiation. That'd be MRI and ultrasound. But trust me, I work with those also in the hospital. All right, I like to move around. I'm stuck with this microscope, uh, microphone here. Uh, I like to dance. Okay, each time we perform a diagnostic test in the laboratory, basically, or in the hospital, what we do is we either put radioactivity inside of you or we use radiation to pass through you to make an image. And that's what's known as an acute dose. It's all at once. It's either spread out over just a few seconds in the case of a CT or over mid the course of two or three days when we do an Octrea scan on you. An acute dose is one that's very short, okay? And as people, what y'all don't realize is that you've been exposed to chronic radiation your whole life. Most people don't ever think about that. With acute doses, we have some say-so in the amount of radiation that we want to get. I really don't want to have this test, Doc. I had a CT last week. 
it really doesn't make sense, it's a slow growing tumor, so forth and so on. But in the case of our diagnosis, we always come down to this wonderful balance between cost versus benefit. Will this exam give me some benefit for the cost of the radiation? Well, how much is the radiation costing you? Nobody explains that. Today, I'm going to try to do that. Chronic doses come from the environment that you live in, and most people don't ever think about the fact that they're chronically exposed to radiation. As far as our bodies are concerned, they don't care whether or not you got it all at once in the hospital or over a period of time in the house that you live in. Our bodies respond to radiation the same way for the acute or chronic doses. And since radioactivity has been here since the beginning of time, your body knows how to respond to radiation. I always use this analogy. The first time you got a cold, you didn't die. The first time you got a paper cut, you didn't bleed out. Radiation's been here since as long as the cold virus, as long as people have been bleeding. And basically, our bodies know how to repair radiation damage. It's like in the case of water. Too much water, you drown. Too much radiation, you die. It's all natural. But nobody ever explains it to you in that particular parameter because if they hold it over your head, that's this dangerous radiation you need to keep you away from, somebody can pay you an awful lot of money to protect you from it, right? Right. Okay? So, it comes from lots of sources. And like I said, it's been here since the beginning of time. If you don't believe me, actually I've got some wonderful sources of radiation here. All of the thorium in the universe is radioactive. Thorium-232 is radioactive. You'll find it in thorium welding rods. It's that lovely color in rose-colored glasses up there. Um, we contain carbon, carbon, tritium, and potassium-40, which is naturally occurring in the environment. Um, that lovely orange glaze on those dishes, that's uranium. Y'all have heard of carbon age dating, right? You ever wonder how that worked? A certain percentage of all the carbon in your body is radioactive carbon-14. It comes from outer space. And while you're alive, if you drink that liquor there with carbon-14 in it, it incorporates in your body. We find a piece of tissue in the desert, and we look for the amount of carbon-14 in it, and if it's got less than half the amount of living tissue, then it's been out there 5,730 years, or one half-life of carbon-14. Now, most people don't realize they're naturally radioactive. Let me go back to my picture here. Light salt is a good example. Light salt contains uh, potassium-40. Anybody got a clue how long the half-life of potassium-40 is? It'll be around longer than me. It's a billion years. Okay? So that potassium was there before I was a twinkle in anybody's eye. And it was there long before Gene learned how good food was in South Louisiana. Okay? So, like I said, it's naturally occurring. Our body knows how to respond to radiation. And I had already given you the example of the carbon-14. Well, let's get some numbers here. Because I'm a physicist, and I have to give you some numbers. So we'll do a test later, OK? All right. If you live in the state of Louisiana, we have very few old, stable geologic formations. For a year of living in South Louisiana and eating fried chicken and God knows what else, we pick up about 200 millirem a year. If you live in California, it's got a slight higher elevation, so you get some more out of, uh, radiation from outer space. You also have some older geologic formations, so you pick up about 300 millirem a year for living in California. Colorado, being up in the Rocky Mountains, gets more uh, cosmogenic radiation from outer space. You'll pick up about 500 millirem a year. What's the outlier there? Pennsylvania. Anybody got a clue why the radiation dose is so high in Pennsylvania? No, you're getting close though. Old geologic formations, radon gas comes up into their homes and gets trapped. It's naturally occurring, lovely radioactive material, and they breathe the radon gas in. So people in Pennsylvania pick up about 600 millirem a year just for living in Pennsylvania. The average across the whole United States is about 450 millirem. Now, we guys in South Louisiana, we can handle these new units. So basically, we can handle, so you may have heard of sieverts, millisieverts. You ever heard this word before? Doesn't make any sense at all? Well, we didn't either at the nuclear power plant. I used to work up the road at the nuclear power plant, and we used to put everything in man rem. But they told us that was not gender neutral, so it became person rem. And then they made us get rid of rem into sieverts because they became person sieverts. So now when the nuclear power plant melts down up the river, we tell we've released so many perverts on the environment. 
Does that work for you? We released at least five perverts when the reactor meltdown. <laughs> Sieverts are the newer unit. They're just uh, CGS, their metric. And the way it works out for these particular units is that they're 100 times bigger than the ones we had before, just to confuse everybody. Okay, so, but when you go get your CT exam, they either put it in sieverts or milligray just to confuse us even more, okay? Radiation can't be detected by our senses, so we depend upon a piece of equipment to actually measure it for us, okay? If you were at a level where you could actually detect the radiation, you'd be finished living. People who actually see it crackling in the air and so forth are exposed to Hiroshima and Nagasaki levels. Now, speaking of Hiroshima and Nagasaki levels, what is the Russian unit of radiation? Anybody know? It's the comrade. That's what happens when you take one dissident, have them run towards Chernobyl, and when they fall down dead, that's one comrade. <laughs> you didn't know there were physics jokes, did you? There'll be more later. <laughs> Years ago, it was determined that the best way to evaluate radiation was to take a look at the effects on your body. So we went from an exposure in air to something called radiation equivalent mammalian, REM. Those units have been updated these years, gray in the air or sieverts exposed in your body. When you go get a CT exam, they're going to report it to you in milligray. And I'm gonna to try to simplify all that today because you don't need to understand all that stuff because there are people like me around who need to make this less complicated for you, okay? Our millirem is that older term that I talked about before. It's equal to 100, 100 millirem is equal to a millisievert. Now, for the stuff we encounter in a hospital, the stuff you typically deal with, a millirem, a, a hundred millirem, a, millise, a, a millisievert, all these units are equivalent, the grays, the sievert. So we're just gonna basically go and say, if you picked up a milligray of this or a millisievert or that, they're all equivalent. It makes a difference in nuclear power. It depends on the type of radiation, but the stuff you see in a hospital are X-rays, gamma rays, and betas. For them, they're all the same. Let's get an example here. All right. For all intents and purposes, like I said, they're interchangeable. 100 MR is equal to 1 milligray, and 100 millirem is equal to millisieverts. Now, I have a small physicist soapbox. This is my soapbox I hate to get on. But in order to confuse y'all all the time, what they'll do is they'll give you something dose area product, like it's radiation spread out over an area. Totally useless term. I always go back to the air kerma, the dose that's in an air, because I can compare it for a CT to an X-ray to whatever. So I go back to milligray on a machine. For instance, when you have a CT exam of your abdomen, it is not unusual for you to pick up three milligray. Three milligray, what does that mean? Well, I told you about radiation exposure. And how dangerous is that three milligray to you? Now, these are terrifying terms. This is what Hiroshima and Nagasaki terms here for you. All right, 500 millisieverts is then at a level where you actually start to see some slight changes in your blood. Nothing in particular happens in your body, okay? And these are all acute doses, they're all at once, okay? The second level is 1,000 millisieverts. You can see it there, it's 100,000 millirem. You'll never encounter these in a hospital. These are basically atomic weapon numbers. But at that level, you start to feel some psychic distress, you have some gastrointestinal effects. At 300,000 millirem or 3,000 millisieverts, you get what's known as an erythema dose. Anybody know what that is? Your skin reddens like a sunburn. It is not unusual for some of our fluoroscopic procedures that just get a skin dose to have an erythema, but it's highly unusual in a hospital also. At 450 millisieverts, it's what's known as an LD5030. It will kill 50% of you in this room in 30 days without any heroic medical efforts. That was a Chernobyl dose, okay? Basically what happened at Chernobyl was they had a reactor that was built with a tin shed above it, and they decided to run very little water through it and set the reactor on fire. And the reactor was made out of graphite. Anybody familiar with what graphite is? Can you say charcoal briquette? <laughs> they set the charcoal on fire and actually set the reactor core on fire and blew the building, the little tin shed off, and liberated radioisotopes to the environment. All over the whole world. Actually, at the time, 
I was working here in the Department of Environmental Quality, and we found Russian radioisotopes here in Louisiana. They made their way around the world. Okay? So these guys were exposed to a lethal level of radiation. The next one, these firemen who came in and tried to put the fire out, which doesn't happen at 600 degrees Celsius, by the way. It just turns to steam. These guys got an LD 5100. That means 100% of them died. Okay? They all died from 6,000 millisieverts. 6,000 mill. that's a lot of dose. At 100,000 or 10,000 millisieverts, you get a full gastrointestinal syndrome, you die within hours, and at about 2,000 millisieverts, it's central nervous effects and you'll survive about an hour. These are terrible doses, incredibly high. Now that we're all terrified, what do we actually encounter in the clinical environment? Now, how many of y'all have, have, some of y'all I'm sure have had PRRT, and a lot of those therapies, my goal as a physicist is to minimize your dose. What we do is we give you a small dose called a dosimetry, and we evaluate how the radiopharmaceutical goes through your body, and we make sure we don't exceed certain thresholds. But outside of these therapy considerations, you're most likely to have a lot of CTs, you've probably had some uh, Octrea scans, and these particular scanners are pretty amazing. Um, I work at Charity Hospital. I don't know if you're all familiar with that. It's one of the oldest continuously operating hospitals in the United States. It was founded in 1736. The new Charity Hospital is across the street from here. You might see it. It's um, University Medical Center. In there, I have a CT scanner that does 256 slices in a second. It can do you from head to toe in about three seconds. That particular scanner actually does it with extremely low dose. The way it works is that you're fed into the machine as the scanner spins around you. It's got 128 rows of detectors. Those rows of detectors have a pencil beam that goes directly to that detector and makes a three-dimensional image of your body in space. And then what we do is we go back in and slice and dice to make a really cool image out of you. Over the years, what has happened with CT scanners is that we found a way to take the noise out of the back end. So it means, since we have less noise in the back end, we lead less radiation on the front end to make a really good picture. For example, in the case of an abdomen study, just 10 years ago, it would take me about 15 millisieverts to do your abdomen. You know what it takes me today? Three. And it makes a really great study. Because basically, I've got a lot more detectors and I've got a lot less radiation that's doing a lot better imaging. Over the years, a lot of y'all, since you have carcinoid, have had a lot of CT scans of your abdomen. The abdomen CT scans now, like I said, are in the neighborhood of maybe three millisieverts or less. Also, by design, the radiopharmaceuticals that we use, by law, are set up so that no dose to any organ will be more than 50 millisieverts to that organ or five millisieverts whole body. So I can guarantee whether you had a fancy FDG scan or if you had a gallium dota take or if you had an indium scan, there's a limit to the amount of radiation dose that you're gonna get, cumulative ill over time. Like I said here, here's an absolutely gorgeous image. That is the CT image angiography. And basically what we do is we run contrast through the vessels and subtract out everything we don't want to look at. And that image can be made with like one-fifth of the dose that we had just two or three years ago. A lot of the stuff, the little people like me that you don't see in the background, little wizards of Oz, we get really excited over this stuff, making a better looking image with less radiation dose all the time. And like I said, over the last 10 or 15 years, we've reduced radiation doses in CT by somewhere close to 100% for some of these, 200% for different exams with better quality exams coming out the other end. Okay, let's go back to nuclear exams. Y'all have had a few Octrea scans, right? Hold your hand up if you had an Octrea scan in here. Thank you, most of the room. All right, hopefully your nuclear tech was very kind to you, okay? And basically each one of y'all, even everyone that held your hand up, you reacted differently to the Octrea scan than everybody else in this room. Why? You're all different. Your organs respond differently to excretion of that radiopharmaceutical. So what we use is like a standard man. We call it Olinda. When I do a high-dose therapy, a PRRT on you, I actually use you as the model. 
We'll give you a small quantity of the pharmaceutical. We'll make you image at zero, four, 24, 48 hours. And some little geek in some back room <laughs> will sit down and figure out how quickly your kidneys get rid of that. Now, it's been absolutely amazing to me that I can have this little bitty petite woman with kidneys bigger than my head and this huge football player's got kidneys the size of peas. So what we have to do is design your therapy for you. So I can get an idea basically of what dose you got from all those Octria scans, but I cannot specifically say exactly what you got because every one of y'all is different. But in general, like I told you before, we're limited by law that I can't give you more than 50 millisieverts to any one of those organs or five millisieverts total body, okay? So our detector actually uses you as the source to make a three-dimensional image of whatever binds that radiopharmaceutical, okay? And like I said, we're all unique. The imaging is normally done with about six millicuries of indium pentatriotide, okay? An unbound pharmaceutical comes out mainly through the urinary pathway. And that's one of the things I keep a really close eye on when I do a high-dose therapy is I make sure kidney doses stay below 23 gray or 2300 millisieverts, okay? And it's one of those things I'm very careful about. This is a super scan of a particular patient. All that uptake is actually tumor. But, and it's not that terribly unusual to find an Octria scan like that. It's, this is one of the ones we call a super scan. One of the very first ones I was involved here in 1993, it looked more like a bone scan than anything else. The patient had all of his bone marrow replaced with carcinoid. It was actually quite remarkable. It's part of the reason why I still do this to this day and I actually enjoy working with y'all. But like I said, every patient is different. So what about you? No, why am I not going upstream? Let's go upstream. This is the really boring stuff. You can find it in the package insert, but basically it repeats the dose that you got for each one of those organs. So does your tumor light up with F18 uh, deoxyglucose? Maybe if you got some rapidly dividing tissue. If you got one of those fancy gold, uh, gallium 68 DOTA scans, uh, if you got some of the lutetium, I was a lutetium dude for a good while here. Each one of them has a different organ commitment, but none of them is set up that you're going to get more than five REM to any organ. So let's say Mary, not her real name, has dealt with carcinoids since back before, once again, Dr. Woltering discovered how good the food was in South Louisiana. That's got to be at least 30 years. Good going, Mary. She's had 18 octria scans, 22 abdomen CT scans. She's had one FDG scan that showed nothing and is set to have one of those fancy gallium scans. What is the estimate of her total dose? Well, 18 times 2.61, 22 times 1.5, plus five for that gallium scan, she picked up about 84 rads, which is 0.85 millisieverts over 30 years. Do y'all remember what that dangerous dose threshold was? 500 millisieverts? Is she anywhere near that 500 millisieverts where we can start seeing changes in her blood? And that's spread over 30 years. One of the cool things about radiation therapy is we call it the four R's. Repair, redistribution, reoxygenation, and repopulation. When I first learned how to do external beam radiation therapy, we would take a tumor, and if you think about your tumor as layer of the onions, an onion, we would treat it with radiation and kill the outer cells that were actually active, and then we'd end up with the, another layer of the onion, and we treat it with radiation, and we get pull the layers off. Okay? What happens with typical tumors is that your body will repopulate that area with normal cells, and the cells that are susceptible to radiation become more susceptible because there's more oxygen getting back in there. There's a redistribution of the cells that can be killed, and it's a very effective way. And oh, even with external beam radiation therapy, with most carcinoids don't get, you can see a tumor shrink over time. It's really pretty amazing. Your body is an amazing thing, and it knows how to respond to radiation, and it knows how to respond to therapy. So it's a very effective way for treatment. The exposures you get from radiation imaging are small, and they're getting smaller all the time. If you have any questions about this, every facility, every facility that you go to, doesn't matter where it is in the United States, has a little geek in the back room. See? And you say, Greg says, I want to see the geek. Show me my dose and the little geek will show you dose, okay? He won't look as attractive as me, and he probably won't have that good a sense of humor, and he won't let you hit the pinatas, but he'll be there, okay? So, 
lucky few of us that get to practice with y'all are always working to achieve lower doses. Although you don't see us, we're very concerned with these issues. And even in the case of high dose therapies, we strive to keep your organ doses small. <laughs> Every once in a while, you want to hit that thing on Google that says, I'm feeling lucky. I typed in the word happy, and I was feeling lucky. <laughs> so it's been a pleasure speaking to you. I'm going to be around for a while. I'm sure you got six bazillion questions. Where did I get this attractive tie? How do I put up with Gene for 30 years? Other stuff like that, and I'll be more than happy to answer it for you. <laughs>